Okay, we're going to go over Concept 1 notes on scientific method and the nature of science. All right, so the nature of science. I love this quote from the National Academy of Sciences because I think it just does a perfect job explaining what science really is. And it says, science is a particular way of knowing about the world. In science, explanations are limited to those based on observations and experiments that can be substantiated by other scientists. Explanation that cannot be based on empirical evidence are not part of science. So I love this because it really shows that the emphasis of science is on experimentation. And because of this, it's so critical that you understand the scientific method that goes behind designing any experiment or laboratory investigation. So that's what we're going to go through right now. So again, science is based on experimentation. And the development of an experiment tends to follow the scientific method, which if you've been taking science for a while, you've probably become really familiar with. So first, um, experimentation usually starts with asking some sort of question, you know, inquiring about something that you want to know more about. Once you've asked a question, it's important to conduct some background research to see what other people have figured out about this topic. Then from there, you can construct a hypothesis, which we'll talk more about. You'll then test your hypothesis in an experiment, analyze the data that you get, and then draw conclusions and communicate them. So what we're going to do is we're going to take each of these steps of the scientific method and we're going to kind of input them into a laboratory investigation and what you would do for a full laboratory write-up. Because when you're writing a formal lab report, you're going through these six steps. Um, but you have like more specific labeled sections of those. So we're going to kind of go through and hit on each of these. So ask a question. Um, questions are usually based on observations we make. So, you know, we see something and then we have a question about it. So it's important to understand what an observation is. An observation is a description of something you can see, smell, touch, taste, or hear. So you're using your five senses to describe something. It's very important to understand that observations are not opinions. They have to be objective, meaning any person could walk in a room and see what you're seeing and say that same thing. Um, so examples, um, that's, I think that's the best way to kind of get this, is the ground is wet. Um, many people could look at the floor and see that it is wet. An inference, though, is going to be a guess about an object or outcome based on what you observe. So you're observing something that's very objective, but then you're going to guess, you're going to put your opinion into what you think is going on. We can make several inferences from a single observation. So example, remember our observation was the ground is wet. That, is a, that could be a fact that many people could look at and see. Inferences could be that it rained, that someone was watering the plants, that there's a leak, that someone spilled something. These are inferences we can make about an observation that the ground is wet. So I want you to try to make some observations and inferences about this family photo. This is actually one of my family photos. Um, and I'm this little tyke on the left. And um, I would love for you to pause for a second and make some observations and inferences for yourself. Now, some examples, if you've already paused and taken your own little notes. Observations could be that there are five people in this picture. You know, anyone could count and see that there are five people. Um, observations could be that there is an older man and some younger kids. Um, observations could be that there is a tree. So really basic, non-opinion things. Um, an inference is any sort of guess about this picture. So, you know, an inference is that, you know, this man is a grandparent. Um, 
based on these children's expressions and inference could be that they don't know this kid in the photo. Um, we see a little lightsaber here, so an inference could be that this kid just came out of something Star Wars related. So those are examples of some observations and inferences. Now, continuing with this ask a question part of scientific um, method, observations are always either qualitative or quantitative. Qualitative observations describe qualities. So you can see qu the word quality is in qualitative. I also like to remember that there's an L, and when I think L in qualitative, I think of letters. So I think I'm going to be using letters, I'm going to be using words to describe something. Examples, a green liquid, a large hole, a sour taste, a sweet smell. Those are all observations using different senses, but they're all using descriptive words. Whereas a quantitative observation uses numbers to measure something. So again, you can see the quantity or numbers is in here. But again, I see that in, and that's where I think numbers. So L reminds me I'm going to use letters. I'm going to be using words and descriptions. N reminds me I'm going to be using numbers. So examples, four feet long, six legs, 7.2 grams, 100 milliliters, that kind of thing. If we were to go back to the previous photo, one of my observations was that there were five people in the photo. That is a quantitative observation. Whereas when I said there is an older person and there's younger people, that would be a qualitative observation. Let's try to do qualitative and quantitative on this next photo. So this is um, a little photo collage of my niece. And so I want you to pause I want you to write qualitative observations, quantitative observations, and then make some inferences. Okay, so a qualitative observation, you know, could be that there is a blonde toddler, or there are red cookies, or um, she has on a navy shirt, or she has brown eyes. Quantitative observations could be that she is holding one cookie, or you could count how many cookies are in here and say, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five. Six. There are 21 cookies on the pan. Um, and then inferences could be that she took a bite out of each cookie on the pan. Um, inferences could be that she looks mischievous. You know, that's, an, that's, again, we're making guesses and assumptions about the photo. Now, specifically looking at quantitative data, looking at those numbers, there's two things you need to be really careful of in investigations. Is your quantitative data needs to be precise and accurate. And it's super important that you know the differences between these words. Precise data is talking about how close your measurements are to each other. So if I'm taking precise measurements, I want them to be consistent and or specific. In terms of specific, I don't want to just measure someone's height and say they're about five feet tall. A specific, a precise measurement would say they are five feet two inches tall. Also in terms of being precise and consistent, that means if I was going to measure that person's height a hundred times, each time I would be consistently getting around the same measurement, which means I would be making precise measurements. Not only that, though, we want our measurements to be accurate. Accuracy measures how close your measurements are to the correct or accepted value. So when you think accurate, you think correct. You know, if someone is 5 feet 2 inches tall, that is the known or correct or accepted height that they have, when you measure them with a ruler, you should be getting 5 feet two inches tall if it's an accurate, correct measurement. And always when you're looking at a measurement instrument, we want to give the most specific reading possible. This will not only help us be precise, but also hopefully be more accurate. And then we want to estimate one more decimal place. So we're going to read what we see, and then we're going to estimate one more decimal place, make it as specific as possible. And we'll practice this with some measurement stations um, together in class. So I love these pictures because these show the differences between being precise and accurate. So in a bullseye, if you're throwing darts or shooting a bow and arrow or whatever you're doing with the bullseye, 
the correct place, the accurate place to hit is in the center. So looking at this first picture, there's four you know, darts thrown. All four are hitting the same place, thus they're precisely being thrown. They're consistently hitting the same place. But they're also hitting the right place. They're in the center. And that's why we would say that this picture is both accurate and precise. All right, looking over here, this person is throwing the dart and they're consistently hitting the same place, but they're not very accurate. So we would say that this person is precise, but not accurate. This person down here is getting near the bullseye each time. So they're really close to being correct, but they're not being very precise. They're kind of hitting each corner of the bullseye. So we'd say they're accurate, but not very precise in their hits. And then this person is not near the bullseye and is not consistent. So we would say that they are not accurate or precise. All right, so step two scientific method is we need to conduct some background research. And we're going to use that research to define a purpose or objective in our lab report or in our investigation. And the purpose and objective is going to be the goal of our investigation. Now, in general, the goal of investigations is to answer some sort of question. So we're going to use observations, we're going to ask questions, and we're going to conduct research what to see what's already been found. Then we're going to find a purpose, a statement for our lab to go from there. Again, this will be a statement. It's going to clearly show what question you're trying to answer in your investigation, and we want it to be something that someone else hasn't already tried to answer. From there, you're going to be able to construct a hypothesis. And you are in high school now, so we are not going to call hypotheses um, educated guesses. We have a much, much more correct definition for a hypothesis. So a hypothesis is a testable prediction based on observations. So it's more than just a guess. And it describes a cause and effect relationship between variables. And the format for a hypothesis is if the independent variable happens, then we think the dependent variable is going to happen. Now, you don't always have to use this format, but it's a really good format to use um, to make sure you're kind of setting it up correctly. IV, again, stands for independent variable, and that's the cause. And then our DV is going to be the dependent variable or the effect. So let's talk more about these IVs and DVs. So an independent variable is what the experimenter is going to deliberately change or manipulate in an investigation. It's the x-axis on a graph, and it's the only thing that should be different between all the different groups that you're testing. It's the only thing we really want to change. So for example, if, let's say we wanted to do an experiment to see if what you drink before running in a race affects how quickly you run. The independent variable is what we're deliberately changing or testing. So that would be what we're actually going to be drinking. So the different drinks that runners have is what we would be actually testing and purposely changing. Now, dependent variable is what changes in response to the independent variable, which is why we often call it the effect. It goes on the y-axis of a graph. And it's usually represented by what sort of data you're actually collecting. You know, what is it that you're going to measure? And you can measure multiple things, but it's usually what we're going to be collecting. So think about that running experiment. If the independent variable, what we're testing, is what the runners are going to drink, the dependent variable is what we're going to measure to see if that has an effect. And what we're, we would measure is how quickly they would run. The dependent variable would be how quickly they will run. All right, now, in order to test your hypothesis and experiment, for a lab report, we then have to write up materials and procedures. So what are we going to use and how are we going to do this? So materials section is what are you going to need to conduct this experiment? You know, we want to include amounts if we're doing a formal lab report so that someone could replicate and know how much we used. We'd want to include in brands um, of products if that's relevant or important. And we'd want to just be as specific as possible. And typically this is going to be in a bulleted list, not in paragraph form, just so it's really easy and clear to read for someone who wants to replicate what you're doing. After materials, we then write the procedures out. And it's important to write out every single step that's taken. And good procedures, each step usually starts with an action word or a verb. So do this, collect this, measure this, um, something like that. Every step should be 
in a way that someone could replicate it. But again, we don't want to have fluffy words. You want it to be very, very clear. And this should be a numbered list, so it's very easy to follow along with. Now, when you're going to design the experimental procedures, there's some things you always need to consider. First being that experimental group or experimental groups because you can have more than one. These are the groups that are being tested or messed with, you could say. So thinking back to our running experiment, um, the experimental group would be all of the people that are drinking, you know, some sort of fun drink, um, a non-traditional drink. So maybe like a Gatorade or a Red Bull or orange juice or milk or something like that before the race, something you wouldn't typically drink before you ran, and that would be the experimental group. Something else you always have to have is a control group. Now this could potentially be one of the most important things, and this is a group that's going to be used for comparison. This is going to be our normal group. So in our running experiment, this would be the group that just drinks water before the race, because drinking water is what people normally do before a race. You know, this, ex this control group is so critical because without it, we don't know how people would normally run in the race. And so our experimental data just isn't really that good and, or useful without this control group for comparison. So it's really important. Another thing that is so critical are constants, or some people call them controlled variables. These are aspects of an experiment that are held constant or consistent among all groups. So this is going to make sure that all aspects of the trial are identical except for my independent variable, which is the only thing that I want to be different. And this ensures that if any differences arise, um, it's due to the fact that the independent variable is causing these effects. And so that's really important. So for our running example, if I'm wanting to test as my independent variable these different drinks, Everything else needs to be the same. So my runner should be the same age, the same gender, have the same breakfast, the same training, the same shoes and equipment. As many things should be kept constant as possible so that the only difference between my runners is what they're drinking. And that way, when I measure those differences at the end, I measure that dependent variable, how quickly they're running, I can say that any differences that result are due to the independent variable. Finally, you should always consider having repeated trials. And this is really important to repeat the trials because we want to make sure that the results we end up with aren't just due to chance. They weren't just random. We didn't just get lucky. We want to have as many repeated trials as possible to eliminate any errors, any places where there weren't consistencies or constants. And just to ensure that our data is preci as precise as possible. Again, you're not a robot, so you won't be able to be perfect, but we want to have the most accurate and precise data as possible. Once we've done an experiment, we've gone through the procedures, then in your lab report, and then what comes next is results and analysis. So in the results, that's where you're going to collect your data in an organized form during the investigation. So, you know, maybe making a data table or and then taking that and making some sort of graph. Graphs we really love because it gives us a visual representation of what we're looking at. It's a lot easier to look at than raw numbers in a data table. From there, we're going to analyze our results and analyze what we got. We're going to only make statements about what the data shows. Um, we're going to refer to our graphs. We're not going to state whether our hypothesis is right or wrong. We're just going to make observations and inferences about what our data shows. And it's usually a good idea in this analysis sec section to talk about any errors you could have made, any places that you weren't very consistent, where you didn't set up good constants in advance that could have affected your results. Then last but not least, we're going to draw conclusions from what we've done, and we're going to communicate those so others can learn from what we've learned. In your conclusion, you're going to make an explicit, a very clear statement about whether your hypothesis was supported or rejected by your experimental data. We never say right or wrong. We always use the term supported or rejected. Either the data supports what you predicted or it fails to support, and then it causes you to reject your prediction that you made. We never say that we're proving or disproving anything. And then typically in the conclusion, you're also going to state some sort of real-world